In uh, Psalm 118, there is uh, an emphasis as we work our way through the psalm on the light that the Lord gives. But before we get to that verse, we see in the first four verses the emphasis on God's mercy which endures forever, and we should be grateful for it because God has indeed been very good to us. And the psalmist reminds us of that. Imagine if we were given the judgment that we deserve. And yet, um, God has not done that. Instead, we're able to call upon him. We don't deserve it, but we're able to call upon him in our distress, and he delivers us. He comes alongside us, and he puts us in pleasant places for which we ought to be thankful. He is for us. Who can be against us? We're reminded of that in this psalm, just as we are in Romans chapter 8. It's so much better to trust in the Lord, who is good and merciful in his disposition toward us, according to verses 5 through 9. There isn't anything that we cannot do because the Lord will help us to do it. Now, the only qualification there is there's not anything that we cannot do that we ought to do before him. Uh, because he's called us to do it, he will strengthen us to do it. Indeed, he is our strength and our song, the psalmist writes. Every avenue of deliverance that we take comes from the Lord. And that includes the avenue of deliverance that we take when we're tempted. Verses 10 through 14. Therefore, we rejoice in his right hand. That's where Jesus is now, at the right hand of the Father. He died, he was buried, he rose again, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. We rejoice in this right hand because it does valiantly. It is a symbol of God's power in the scriptures. And it is exalted, the psalmist says. We declare his works. When we think about the name of the Lord, we think about what he has done for us, the works of the Lord. We think about his character, all of the different components, all the different things that are coming to us in their fullness. Um, this is the name of the Lord. <clears throat> we declare this. We do it even in the midst of severe chastening, which all of us face from time to time because we need correction. We need to remember, as the psalmist did in verse 18, he has not given us over to death. And for that, we could be thankful. I like how he mentions that the way is narrow in verses uh, 19 and 20, the idea of the gate here through which we find righteousness. Of course, Jesus is the gate. We look to him. No one comes to the Father except through him. He is the stone that the builders have rejected in this psalm. He is the chief cornerstone. Uh, the, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in his eyes, the psalmist says. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We often take that verse out of its context, but here, this, this day that we think of, the way that God has revealed his righteousness and has given his righteousness to us, certainly comes into our thoughts as we read through the psalm. This is marvelous. Verse 25, come, you, we want prosperity come to us, but, but not prosperity by our own definition. It has to be prosperity by God's definition. The deliverance that God gives to us, the prosperity that God grants to us, all, all of it seems to be at odds with my idea of prosperity at times. Uh, it's at odds with my idea of deliverance. I, I would want God to deliver me speedily, right away. I wouldn't want to go through what I'm going through in the first place. And yet God knows what I need. Anyone who comes in the name of the Lord comes then in the power of his character and his might. Verse 26, they are among the people that we most certainly bless. The people that we look forward to being with and speak well of in the house of the Lord. Indeed, we give thanks to the Lord for he is good, as verse 29 says again, just as the psalm opened up with the idea of his mercy enduring forever, it closes with the idea of his mercy enduring forever. And so what I'd like to do is focus in on verses 27 and 28 for our devotional tonight, where we read, God is the Lord, and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords 
to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Psalm 118, I think, reminds us of two very important truths. The first truth is, is a well-established fact. The second builds on it. And that first truth is God's word stands forever. Everything that God has revealed to us in his counsel, in his word, it, it stands forever in spite of the opposition that we face or the adversity or the trials or whatever it happens to be. And since that is true, number two, those who trust in the word of God will stand as well forever. We will stand in spite of the trials, in spite of the opposition, in spite of the difficulty, and sometimes in spite of the prosperity. We will be able to stand. And so what I'd like to do is look at this idea and, and amplify it a bit. Psalm 118 is applied often to the Lord Jesus because it is quoted in the New Testament. When Jesus entered, for instance, into Jerusalem on the Sunday before his crucifixion, we, we call it tri a triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we call it Palm Sunday. Uh, when he did that, the multitudes cried out, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's in Matthew 21 and verse 9. And it's a quotation of what we read here in Psalm 118 and verse 26. Later in Matthew 21, and verse 42, we read another quotation of Psalm 118. It's verses 22 and 23. This is where Jesus is referred to as the stone which the builders rejected, as the chief cornerstone. It's marvelous in our eyes. Peter quotes that same passage in Acts chapter 4 and verse uh, 11 when he's preaching filled with the Holy Spirit according to verse 8 of that passage. Now notice that verse 27 then, says that the Lord has given us light. He's given it to us. So we receive this light. And so there are two important points that we could stress <coughs> about the idea of light here in Psalm 118. The first is we need to receive this light. The second is once we've received it, it's important that we respond to it on a daily basis. And so let's look at the reception of light first. Everything was dark before the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, that's just the way it was. Uh, things were different. Even, even as he came into the world and everything was so promising and full of hope, by the time we get to his crucifixion, and, and certainly right when he is crucified, everything is shattered. The disciples and what they understood uh, must have been very limited because by the time, even though Jesus very explicitly told them what was going to happen, they, they somehow don't believe it. And so they, they don't have the hope they should have that on the third day he will rise, just as he said. The world is mocking. They think that they've put this whole uh, thing to rest, that the upstart is no longer around to threaten the power block that is there and the religious leaders that are, are, that are there. So all of the expectation, the fact that he would be the Messiah, all of that just kind of uh, trickles down to this just very slow ebb. And people are looking at the situation. They can't believe what has happened. Well, Jesus, though, did not stay in the grave. He, was di he died. He was buried. On the third day, the Bible says he rose again. And so... This brings the light into the world. This is unalterable light. Once Jesus rises from the dead, once he's seen by the many, and once he ascends to the right hand of the power of God, then the light has come. And nobody can deny that the light has come. That's the idea here. So how have we received it? Well, in three ways. Number one, we've received it. We receive the light through the cross of Jesus Christ. That's how we... Uh, found the light. In, in our passage it says, bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. That's what the psalmist says. Well, that sacrifice that he was speaking of, that just is a shadow of the substance of the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross. An atonement that was made once for all uh, upon the cross. His resurrection, his ascension, the sending of the Holy Spirit, all of these combine to teach us that 
there shouldn't be any doubt in our minds as we approach him tonight in our prayer time. Jesus is declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness, it says in Romans chapter 1, verse 4, by the resurrection of the dead. And so indeed, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God. Again, the place of power, who also makes intercession for us. We pray, he is praying. He continually makes intercession for us. Um, we receive light through the cross of Christ. Second, we receive light through the grace of Jesus Christ. There isn't anything that he cannot do for me. That's what the psalm is teaching me. Uh, I, I, if I need to do it, and, and this is God's will for me, then I can do it. I, I call upon him for the grace that I need to do it, and that grace I find is always sufficient for me. So therefore, in times of prosperity, in times of adversity, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4 and verse 13. The God of peace, we're told in Romans 16 and verse 20, the God of peace shall crush Satan under our feet shortly. That's what he has promised to us. We receive light through the grace of Jesus Christ. We receive light through the cross of Jesus Christ. And then third, we receive light through the glory of Jesus Christ. <coughs> and this is a glory that he will share with us. I think we sometimes forget that. We say Jesus is upon a throne in heaven and he deserves the glory. And certainly he does. But the Bible also reveals to us in Luke 22 and verse 29 that it's a throne of glory at the right hand of God and that glory awaits, uh, that glory is there for me as well. I can't wrap my mind around that, but that's what the scriptures teach. The Father bestows the kingdom upon the Son and the Son says, I will bestow a kingdom upon you. And so we are going to reign with Christ. Glory reserved for the Son is the glory that's reserved for you and for me. Even our earthly bodies, right? We will shed them. And, and what was uh, mortal, what was temporal, what was corruptible will become glorious, the Bible says. Just like the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our spirits, who we are, body and spirit, it, there will be a finality to the transfer that, or the, the, the translation, I guess, that occurs. There will be a finality to it because we, we, we shall have the mind of Christ. We, we will know him in a way that we cannot know him now. And so we look forward to that day. We have in heaven an incorruptible, undefiled, unfading inheritance that is waiting for us. We share in this glory. We receive light and glory through the glory of Jesus Christ. So with that reception, everything that God has given to us, how shall we now live, to borrow a book title? How, how are we going to live? How are we going to respond to that? What shall we do uh, to respond to the light that God has given to us? Two things. We should render our service and rejoice in our Savior. Number one, we render a reasonable service. That's at Romans chapter 12. Verses 1 and 2 teach us the acceptable sacrifices of God that fuel service are a broken heart, a, a contrite spirit before him. These he will not despise, the scriptures say. And so we render a reasonable service to him and uh, we do so by responding, our hearts responding to the light that he's given to us. The writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews 13 and verse 15, Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Thus we render what is only reasonable, our service. And number two, we rejoice in our righteous Savior. Uh, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live, I live uh, I live. I live it by. In, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. I like that last bit of Galatians two and verse twenty, who loved me and gave Himself for me. That's how I respond. 
I respond to what he has given to me and so I give. We love him because he first loved us. We give because he first gave to us. Everything, everything just kind of evolves in the good sense of the word out of my relationship uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ in my life. And so we, we always need to hold on to that. And then second, we rejoice in our righteous Savior. Uh, and, and that means when we get to the idea of verse 28, we understand that all the joy and the gratitude that's in our hearts ought to culminate in that. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, I will exalt you. And so we rejoice in this righteous Savior that has been given to us. Now, <clears throat> I've often said it, there are really only two groups of people that are in the world. There are those that are in this light and those that are still in the darkness. And for those that are still in the darkness, they, they're afraid. They fear. They remain ignorant because they, they can't ascertain truth. They, they're natural men. Natural men do not receive the things of the Spirit of God. They can't know them because they're, they're spiritually known. They don't understand that the Word of God shall... Uh, shall last forever. They don't understand that it will always stand and if we trust in him, we shall stand too. They don't understand that idea and so our heart is that people like that might be transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. But in order for that to happen, we need to open our mouths with the love and the gift that God has given to them too so that they may receive it and respond to it just as we do. Now for those that are, that are in the light, which would be almost all of us here, probably all of us here in, in the room this evening, if we're going to respond to the light, we need to rejoice. They are fearful, we rejoice. They are ignorant, we grow in knowledge. They don't understand, we understand what Jesus has done for us. And so because of that, and because of the fact that he saves completely and continually makes intercession, we live out of that. That's a light that we know is there. We're constantly aware of it. What makes it a shame is that we sometimes willfully ignore it so that we can do what we want to do. We marginalize the light. We push it out of our lives. Its influence is there. But the Bible says we must walk in the light as he is in the light. And so it's not enough to say, well, I recognize it and then not walk in it. That will invite the severe chastening of the Lord. And so my prayer tonight is that we would see that, that we would uh, respond to it, and that we would please the Lord with our lives tonight. Let's pray together.